Hello everyone, Couch Tomato here, and today I'm going to go over the rules for chalk or Mayan chess. Now first I'm going to start with an introduction to chalk and how it was conceived. So the main inspiration for chalk is looking through the history of chess. So here's a map of uh, the major chess variants in the world. And for those who don't know, uh, the most prevailing theory is that chess started in India under the name of Chaturanga. And from there it kind of spread outwards. On the west side, the game went through Persia where it was called Chachanj, and this was in the early Middle Ages. And from Persia, it spread all throughout Europe and North Africa, and eventually evolved into modern chess, which is played by most of the Christian and Islamic world. Now on the east side, it took multiple forms. In Southeast Asia, it turned into the not-so-different Makruk. In China, it became the radically different Xiangqi. And in Japan, we don't really know where shogi came from definitely, but it has elements of both shanqi and makruk. So at this point, when we're talking about the Middle Ages, we basically have chess being spread all throughout the old world, and most of the major empires and civilizations of that time are playing some form of chess that they've adopted as their own. But the thing is, there is actually more to the world than just the old world. There's also flourishing civilizations in the new world. And so here's a world map of what the world looked like at that time. And you can see one of the most sophisticated societies in the Americas was the Maya civilization. They were very advanced for their writing and technology compared to their peers in the Mesoamerican region. And so I was thinking, what if these Mayan peoples somehow got a hold of a version of chess and created one of their own? And so this is how Chak was conceived. I thought of a game where basically Mayans got a hold of Xiangqi and chess and didn't quite understand the rules, but created something of their own. And I went with some basic chess principles. So for starters, every single form of chess has a rook that moves straight up and down, left and right, no exceptions. And um, also every major form of chess has some form of knight. There's some various changes, but there's got to be something that's like a knight. And then finally, each form of chess also has a pawn, but each pawn is actually something unique, and that uniqueness kind of defines that type of chess. And so I kind of took those pieces together and started putting together a board. Uh, but on top of that, that board also has to reflect the cultural preferences and sensibilities of the Mayan people. And so they're a very religiously oriented culture, really big into ritual sacrifice. And so I had to incorporate that into the game as well. So ultimately, I came up with this game called Chak, and it was playtested through the AI, and this is the final version we have here. The name Chak comes from one of the Mayan gods, Chak, who is the god of uh, rain and storms. And usually if the rain and storms kind of coincide with war, so I wanted to pick a god that was more associated with war. But it also works out that Chak sounds a lot like chess, or some other languages' names for chess, for example, German Schach. So I thought it was very appropriate for a name. So that's where the name comes from. And so onto the actual game itself, the board is a 9x9 board, and you can see here it's kind of painted gray, and that's to reflect a stone board because the Mayans would probably play on some kind of stone tablet or board with Mayan glyphs to reflect each of the pieces. Here I don't have Mayan glyphs, I, I have traditional kind of symbols, but if you can imagine, here is what one looks like, and this would be the symbol for the king or Ahau in Mayan. But for the sake of our modern day players, I tried to use something more symbolic. So since I just mentioned the Ahau, let me talk about that piece, or as we'll call it, the king. So the king are these two pieces over here in the center, last rank of each player's camps. And the goal is the same as most forms of chess. You want to checkmate the other king by attacking it and attacking in a way that it can't escape anywhere else. But that's actually only one of the ways of winning in this game. The other way of winning is based on these features on both sides of the board, which are the temples. And now you may recognize these temples from famous Mayan sites in Mexico and Guatemala, like Chichen Itza. And the temples are where the sacrifices happen. So actually sitting in the center of the temple is the piece called the Offering, and that's represented by a fish. The Offering actually does nothing, it can't move, it literally just takes up space, um, but it can block your own pieces. And because it can block your own pieces, it does have some strategic value. 
Um, but the main point I want to mention is that if you manage to get your king to the other side and move him onto the square where the offering sits, right in the middle of the temple, that's the other way to win. So that's basically the purpose of the temple. Even though the temple is shaped like a 3x3 three three square, there's really nothing special about most of the squares except for the center one. The rest is just mostly aesthetic. So that's one of the major features of the board. The other major feature of the board is this squiggly line over here, which is the river. And now I'm just going to briefly introduce another board image. This is a more colorful, optional board you can use. Uh, you can see the stone temple still remains its gray color, but everything else is colored. And the river is now colored in teal. But anyways, going back to the stone board. So what is the purpose of the river? So the river marks the border of where pieces can promote. And if anyone's familiar with Chinese chess or Xiangti, this is very similar to the river in that game. Now there are only two pieces that can promote. And of course, one of them is the pawn. So the moment the pawn reaches the river, it promotes. But the other piece that can promote is actually the king. And this is one of the only games that I know of where the king can promote too. So when the king reaches the river, it too can promote. And what's also unique about the river is that once you choose promotion, and promotion is forced by the way, you don't have a, an option, you can't go back. So both the promoted king and the promoted pawn can only move in this region. And so actually in chalk, promotion is a double-edged sword. While these pieces both get stronger, they're also limited to one half of the board. So those are the major rules, and just to summarize, I'm going to go over all the ways the game can end. So I mentioned checkmate which is basically eliminating the other player's king. There is altar mate, which is moving your promoted king into the opponent's altar, which is the center square of the temple. There's also technically stalemate, where if the opponent's king can't move at all, and the player has no more legal moves, then that's actually a win for the player delivering the stalemate. This is different than chess, but actually falls in line with many other regional variants of chess. And of course, if your opponent resigns, then that's also a win. Similar to chess, the game can draw with repetition, so if the same position is repeated three times, then the game's over, no one wins. And the other way a game can end in a draw is if 50 moves have been played without a capturing a piece. Also, finally, regarding the start of the game, the white player goes first, followed by the green player. So I removed all the white pieces from the board, and I'll have the green pieces just so you can see the initial positions for reference. And I'll start with the pawn. So the pawn is actually very similar to the western chess pawn. It can move one square forward at a time, and it attacks diagonally forwards. But on top of that, it could also move one space sideways without attacking. So the pawns are a lot more flexible. You only start with five of them, unlike western chess where you start with eight. And so there's a lot of maneuvering in chalk to get pawns to actually form a pawn structure. And then since we're talking about the pawn, let's talk about its promotion, the warrior. So upon reaching the river, the pawn becomes a warrior. And the warrior can basically move and attack any of these squares. So the top three squares adjacent to the piece and the bottom three squares adjacent to the piece. Or you can think of it as moving like a chess king that can't move sideways. But again, remember, if the warrior is on the river, it can't go backwards. So it's actually only limited to three squares. So actually, the moment when the pawn becomes a warrior, it's actually quite vulnerable. So since we're talking about the warrior, I'm also going to bring up a very similar piece, which is the shaman. And the shaman has the exact same movement as the warrior. So again, any of these three squares and any of these three squares. The only difference between the shaman and the warrior is that the shaman starts in your home territory, down here, and it has full flexibility. And even if it reaches the river, it can go backwards, whereas the warrior can't. Next, I'm going to bring up another very familiar piece, which is the king. And it moves like many other kings, one square in any direction. And that's all there is to the king. But what about the king's promotion? So when it promotes, it becomes the divine king. And here you can see that marks by a little square symbol on it. And actually, for that matter, we also mark the pawns with a little darkened symbol over here. But in reality, in a real game, there's going to be no symbol change. You just know that when the king and pawn are 
past the river they have special moves. So this king's special moves is that it can move two squares in any direction. Like so. So it's a very flexible king. But keep in mind that if the divine king is at the river, which will happen when it promotes, it actually can't go backwards. So its movement immediately on promotion looks more like this. And then say the divine king was to move here, it can move to any of these squares pretending that there's no piece in the way. But as for going backwards, it can only go as far as the river. So the divine king is a very powerful piece in its own right, but if you lose it, you lose the game. I'm just going to bring this piece back up here. Again, this is called the offering, and it just sits there, it does nothing. Poor fish. The next piece is the serpent, and this is essentially the chest rook. It moves any number of squares, up, down, left, or right. So in this position, this serpent can actually take that pawn. The next piece should also be very familiar to chess players. And while it looks and sounds different, so here we can see we have a vulture, and it's called the vulture, uh, it moves exactly like a chess knight. So it can jump to any of these squares, kind of in an L shape. And finally, that leaves us two of the most powerful pieces in the game. The Quetzal and the Jaguar. I'll start with the Quetzal. The Quetzal is a very interesting piece, but it should be very familiar to someone who's played Shang-Chi, or especially the Korean version, Chang-Gi. It can move any number of squares in any direction, like so, like a chess queen, but with one major difference. It has to jump over a piece first. So right now, in this picture, if this Quetzal was the only piece on the board, it's stuck there, it can't move. But let's say I put this pawn over here, now it could jump to these three squares. What if this pawn was over here? Well, the Quetzal can only move to these two squares. The same goes for capturing. In this situation, the Quetzal can move here or attack the Shaman. And it could jump over friendly or opponent's pieces, so same thing here. It could either move here or attack the Shaman. So the Quetzal is a very powerful piece in the early game because there's so many pieces on the board still, and that allows it to fly all over the board. But by the end of the game, when there are very few pieces on the board, it's not very powerful. But keep in mind, I'm just bringing back the starting position again here. Since we have the offering over here, the Quetzal can use the offering to allow it to move to any of these spots. So the offering also serves an additional purpose as a fulcrum for the movement of the Quetzal. And then finally we have the Jaguar, which is universally considered the most powerful piece in the game. And the Jaguar combines the moves of two pieces. So it's just like the Vulture, where it has jumping knight movement to these eight squares. And on top of that, it has king movement, so it can move one square in any direction. And so this represents the full range of the Jaguar's moves. And it covers quite a large portion of the board. So it's actually very important for you to keep the opponent's Jaguar from penetrating into your side of the board. Because once it does, it could just hop around and fork many pieces with impunity. So finally, I just want to talk about piece value. Because the game's so young and we don't have centuries of experience playing this, we don't have accurate relative piece values like we do in chess. And so for check, we, all we can do is base our values off the AI evaluation. And this is the general order of piece value. The Jaguar is by far the most powerful piece. Almost twice as powerful as the Serpent. So you definitely want to keep the Jaguar alive. Uh, the, the Serpent is the next most powerful piece. And it's just a little bit stronger than the Quetzal. And then you have the Vulture in the middle. Followed by the Shaman, which is just a little bit stronger than the promoted pawn or warrior. And then finally, of course, the pawn is the weakest piece. And as in all types of chess, the value of the king is infinite. So that's it for the rules of Chalk. Because it's quite a complex game and new, I'm not going to go into basic tactics and tips in this video. But if you'd like to see another video on that, please make sure to let me know. Anyways, that's all I got. And if you'd like to see more videos like this, please don't forget to like and subscribe.